This isn't your average 3D print. It's reinforced internally with continuous carbon fibers, making it considerably stronger and more rigid. It was printed on the Fiber Seeker 3, the first consumer grade continuous fiber printer. It's on Kickstarter right now, with a starting price of $26.99, a fraction of that charged for the industrial equivalents. But in cutting cost, did they cut corners too? And exactly how much stronger are these parts? We're going to find out. If you've used any other modern 3D printers, this one's going to look familiar. So let's cut to the chase and talk about what's different, then loop back to the more mundane. You might notice that the print head looks pretty chunky. That's because it has two hot ends. The right hot end is reserved for regular filaments, like PTG, PLA, etc. And these can be from any brand. No material lock-in like you normally see with industrial grade printers. The left hot end combines a regular filament like PTG with a continuous strand of carbon fiber, which is surprisingly affordable at about $50 for a spool of this size. Again, a welcome difference from the more industrial side of the market. Exactly how long a spool like this will last will of course depend on what you're printing. You have the ability to modulate the strength of your part by adjusting the number of reinforced perimeters or the density of reinforced infill. In high strength mode, the outer shell of the model is regular plastic. In hyper strength mode, you can print the part almost entirely from carbon fiber. There will still be some plastic, however, used as a binding agent. This is the secret sauce of this printer, co-extrusion. The two combine inside the heat block and exit the nozzle together as one continuous coated strand. When laying down the carbon fiber, the regular hot end is retracted out of the way so it doesn't collide with the part. The mechanism for achieving this is quite clever in its simplicity. There's no electronics involved. This piece on the side, which you might assume is a filament cutter, is actually a passive linear actuator. When the printhead bumps into the gantry on the left side, it pushes the actuator to the right, and the hot end moves down. And when it travels to its limit on the opposite side, the hot end goes back up. There is also a cutter on this printhead, but it's not passively actuated. It uses a servo motor, and it doesn't cut the filament, it cuts the fiber. It does so in place of a retraction when transitioning between fiber printing and plastic printing. The remaining fiber in the nozzle is then consumed before switching hot ends. The plastic hot end, by the way, appears to be an off-the-shelf clone of a bamboo-style hot end from Triangle Lab, featuring a removable 0.4mm hardened steel nozzle. The carbon hot end is custom and proprietary, with a 0.7mm nozzle. In order to drive the three distinct strands of materials that enter these two hot ends, we've got three dedicated extruders, one direct drive and two Bowden. The one on the print head appears to be an orbiter style. This one at the back appears to be an HGX light, in case that means anything to you. You'd be forgiven if it doesn't. In a nutshell, both dual drive with oversized gears for increased contact area with the filament. But what's really interesting is the carbon fiber extruder. It doesn't use gears at all. To see this in action requires some disassembly, starting with the removal of the right side panel. This also happens to be where the electronics are housed so we'll have a look at those while we're here. Something immediately stood out to me. This component right here. I wasn't sure what this was at first, but in following the wires, I could see that they led to the extruder that brought us here in the first place. And then it clicked. It's a line laser. The fiber breaks the beam, registering its presence. We're about to get to the good part, but first I need to tell you about the sponsor for today's video, Fantic. Fantic is a manufacturer of compact cordless power tools like this E2 Precision Electric Screwdriver. It's what I use to do all of the disassembly and reassembly on this printer. It comes with 50 different bits to cover a wide range of applications, all of which are stored securely in a convenient magnetized case. The driver itself has five torque settings, so you can be sure that nothing is too tight or too loose. I also have one of their larger drivers, the Nex S1 Pro, which came in handy for the larger screws. Without an electric screwdriver, this disassembly process would have been much more tedious. Fantic has holiday sales on right now, and you can use my code in the description to save an extra 10%. So if you're ready to save time on your next printer build or repair process, be sure to check them out. Thanks to Fantic for sponsoring this video. All right, where were we? A bit more disassembly and we were inside the extruder itself. Now, unfortunately, the screws for the housing were also holding the bearings in place so I had to put it back together again before I could see how it worked. With it pieced back together, we can see how it operates, using not gears to drive the fiber, but belts. They sandwich the fiber, pushing it forward as they rotate. All right, 
I said we'd loop back to the more mundane, so here we are. The Fiber Seeker 3 is a fully enclosed Core XY printer, with a build volume of 300 on X, 300 on Y, and 245 on Z. It's got an outer shell of plastic, with tinted acrylic for the left side panel and the door. A little too tinted, if you ask me. And a glass top. Though the instructions I received indicated I should leave this off to prevent hot end clogging. The Z-axis rides on three lead screws and four 8mm smooth rods, all of which seem undersized relative to this printer. I'd expect these to be bulkier. 10mm rods would be on par with other printers of this size. And the same could be said of the belts. The Fiber Seeker 3 uses 6mm belts. Wider belts are stiffer and less prone to stretching. Something like a 9mm belt would be more appropriate, particularly considering how much moving mass there is on this printhead. The lead screws are coupled together with a belt underneath. I'd prefer to see these independently driven to enable bed tail compensation, because I measured almost a full millimeter of deviation over the extent of this bed, which isn't great. But on the bright side, as you might be able to tell from this interface, the printer runs open source clipper firmware, which is a huge advantage in my books. The bed is rated to a maximum temperature of 110 degrees. It features a removable spring steel build plane. I can't tell what the coating is, I don't think it's PEI because PTG usually sticks like hell to that. My PTG prints held well during printing and released easily afterwards. I haven't tried it with very many other materials, but no complaints so far. The unit I received doesn't have a chamber heater, but I see from the spec sheet on the Kickstarter page that the production model will. Combined with a max nozzle temperature of 350 and the ability to deposit continuous carbon fibers, this printer should be able to produce some seriously strong parts. And with that said, let's get to printing. But first, we need to run some calibrations. This is the standard gamut of pre-flight checks that most clipper printers do, like vibration compensation and PID tuning, with one exception, nozzle offset. The determination of the relative position of the two nozzles is accomplished using a spring-loaded pin at the rear of the bed. Bed leveling is accomplished using direct contact nozzle probing, with an integrated piezoelectric sensor in the printhead. One last thing before printing, and that's filament loading. The two plastic spools mount on the rear. Hidden away under this cover are two Big Tree Tech smart filament sensors that can detect both filament presence and motion. The carbon fiber spool has its own compartment on the side. Once we start printing, the first thing you'll notice is just how much slower the fiber deposition is. Regular plastic printing is on par with other modern high speed printers. This Benchy took 36 minutes to complete. It's hard to tell exactly how good the print quality is with transparent filament, but the parts I can see do look fine. When printing in high strength mode, the plastic extrusions are printed fast and the carbon fibers are laid down slow. So the prints might be considerably stronger, but they will take significantly longer. As the saying goes, you can't have your cake and eat it too. My first test of high strength mode was a simple bar with a solid core of carbon fiber. The addition of this reinforcement increases the stiffness of the part considerably, especially compared to unfilled PTG, which is particularly flexible. But to say the parts are simply stronger isn't specific enough. Strength is a blanket term. To break it down, there's tensile strength, flexoral or bending strength, and impact strength. When chopped carbon fiber is added to regular 3D printing filaments, it enhances bending strength, but generally reduces impact strength. Carbon fiber parts can be quite brittle, but not all carbon fiber filaments are created equal. Some use milled fiber, a fine powder, and some use chopped fiber, small segments. Filaments infused with milled fiber are less brittle, but don't have the same gains in strength. Chopped fiber filaments have better mechanical properties, but they still pale in comparison to continuous fibers, which give huge gains in tensile strength, but only in a direction parallel to the fibers. The layer adhesion will still be the limiting factor in the z-axis strength. With that quick material science lesson out of the way, let's try slicing our own parts. Now unfortunately, this printer requires a manufacturer specific slicer, and well, it kind of sucks. It's based on Cura, which I've never been a fan of personally. But what's worse is that they sent me an extremely watered down version on which I couldn't even change basic settings like perimeter count. Fortunately, I was able to find a more advanced version on their website. And based on a post from their social media accounts, it looks like they're coming out with a new version altogether that appears to be built from the ground up. In my opinion, proprietary slicers are never a good thing. But if there were ever an excuse to have one, it would 
probably be this. There are certain settings that only apply to continuous fiber printing, and it wouldn't make sense in a general purpose software like Orca Slicer. The model I sliced was the CNC Kitchen test hook, which I'll later hang off of to see if it can support my weight. As you might notice, there is a fair amount of stringing on this print, which was a theme throughout my time of testing. I believe this results from a combination of factors. The left hot end uses a Bowden extruder, which requires longer retractions, and can be more difficult to dial in for PTG in particular. Also, the nozzle switching procedure requires the print head to move completely away from the print in order to trigger the actuator. This takes time, during which the nozzles can ooze. In addition to the continuous fiber test hook, I also printed one in CFPT and one in CF nylon. I believe based on the properties and the appearance that this one uses milled fiber, while this one uses chopped. As a control, I also printed one in regular unfilled PTG. Now unfortunately, I don't own a proper tensile tester, but what I do have is a swing, a few carabiners, and some dumbbells. Yeah, we're doing this DIY style. The PTG hook broke at around 145 pounds. Next was the carbon fiber nylon. This surpassed the available weight I had in dumbbells and medicine balls. So I threw on a few rolls of filament to seal the deal. Final breaking weight was 196.8 pounds. The CFPT hook broke at a surprisingly low 150 pounds. But upon inspection, I noticed that it was sliced with inconsistent settings which goes to show that optimizing your print settings can go a long way to increasing part strength without the need for a specialized printer. But let's see just how much better the continuous fiber print does. I first tried to see if it could support my weight of 150 pounds. You can definitely hear some creaking, but that might just be the supports, which it did no problem. So I went back to the dumbbells and filament spools. I matched the CF nylon weight and the hook was still holding strong. So I threw on a few more boxes of filament until final breaking weight was 235 pounds, a 20% increase over the CF nylon hook, which honestly wasn't as much as I was expecting. And I think I might know why. If you look closely at the carbon fiber deposits, they're not straight they're squiggly, which is like having slack on a rope. In order to make the maximum contribution to the tensile strength, the fibers need to be pulled tight. So why are these fibers so squiggly? Well, I think that comes down to the extruder we took a look at earlier. As a result of the rolling resistance of the spool on the holder, the grip of the belts on the fiber isn't always sufficient to give smooth forward motion. And just to be clear, all of the parts I tested in this video were printed before I disassembled the extruder. So that's the way it was from factory. So the addition of the continuous carbon fibers does improve the strength of parts considerably, but I don't think the peak performance will be achieved without some refinements to this extruder. The other weak point is the design of the co-extrusion hothead. On multiple occasions, I had fiber escaping from the heat block. And on one occasion, I even had filament oozing out. It turns out that there's an air gap in the fiber path, likely serving to mitigate heat transfer. But in the case of a nozzle clog, the filament will look for somewhere else to go and escape from this orifice. The primary cause of the fiber escaping, as it turns out, was a missing screw that put the hot end slightly out of alignment with the filament path. I was able to rectify that pretty easily, but a more traditional heat break without an air gap would have prevented both of these issues. Overall, I enjoyed my experience using the Fiber Seeker 3. It gets points for the overall aesthetic. I think it looks really nice and it gets points for the use of off-the-shelf components and open source firmware. But I do think they cut corners in a few places, and it's my opinion that some refinements should be made to the parts of this machine that are supposed to be its differentiating factors, because without those, this is just another printer. But assuming they take this feedback seriously, I think this has real potential to disrupt the industrial side of the 3D printing market. Does your average consumer need a continuous fiber 3D printer? No. But at this price point, it's a fun tool to add to your arsenal of maker toys. And I'm sure some of you might have a real world application for which this is particularly well suited. If you do, I'd be curious to hear about it in the comments below, along with any other thoughts you might have about this printer. Thanks for watching. My name's Taylor, this is YGQ3D, 
And until next time, happy 3D printing.